we will be continuing in the book of James. As we continue in this section, what it means to be a doer of the word. That's James chapter 1. I will be reading verses 26 through 27. Hear, for this is God's word. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let us pray. Father, our great God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to read your word, the opportunity to share in the word, and the message that you may have for us this morning. Father, I ask that you would seal these words to the hearts of your people, words that are yours, and all that comes from me that they would forget. Father, we ask that you would bless all those who are hearing and that you would make this word effectual to salvation for those who do not know you and for those who do know you, that they would grow in the likeness of your son. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. There is an old proverb of from Cape Verde Islands in regard to those who slander and tell tales, and it goes something like this. This is a translation, so some of the humor of it may fall short. It goes, if you open your mouth, flies will enter. This was a a proverbial warning, uh, that if you open your mouth too much to speak, And using your mouth to slander, you will be liable to swallowing your own words. And your words are an equivalent to insects. They're addressing those who, with hypocritical judgments in their speech, they will one day swallow their words when you commit the same sin or or realize that you yourself was in the wrong when you expressed your opinions. Now, there is some credence to this old saying because some of the problems that James is addressing in this letter speak to this very issue of an uncontrolled tongue. Here in our letter, we are beginning, in this letter, we are beginning to see the particular sins as they have been laid out in the first chapter as doubting God's goodness and faithfulness in providing for us, and since doubting God's goodness would lead to the pursuit of worldliness or worldly pursuits, and from the failure of worldly pursuits, and we we see this failure as as James would address it in chapter 2 as um, the expression of this worldly pursuit is that they favor the rich over the poor, And, and when the failure of these worldly pursuits come to them, uh, there is anger from the failure, from the pride of it. And from anger, here in our text this morning, comes slander. He defines in summary form two polar opposites here, two polar opposite versions of religion. There is worthless religion in verse 26 and pure religion or true religion in verse 27. Let us first look at worthless religion in verse 26. In verse 26, James is going to answer what is the manifestation of the word? What is 
the perfect law, the law of liberty as revealed in Christ as it plays out in the lives of believers? What is true faith or true religion in its outward expression? He calls them to be doers of the word, not just hearers deceiving themselves. And repeats this deception in describing the one who does not bridle the tongue. He is reiterating his earlier command to be slow to speak in verse 19. Addressing the evils of the tongue which he will later expound in chapter 3. He begins by saying if anyone thinks he is religious or God fearing. A worshiper of God or worshiping God, and does not bridle his tongue, but, or rather, deceives his heart. Again, the heart is the seat of the mind. So, in this sense, he would be deceiving himself, in other words. Again, he is defining what it means to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And he repeats that they would be deceiving themselves if they weren't a doer of the word, or as he defines it, if they do not bridle the tongue. The word used for bridle can also be translated as to guide. A bridle is known as the headgear of a, of a horse, which includes a bit in the mouth and the reins to steer the horse when riding it. The bridle is used to guide or control the horse in the direction that it should go. So he says, likewise, if you think you are religious and do not control or guide your tongue, you have been deceived. In fact, your religion or your faith is worthless useless, of no repute. It produces nothing. But remember from a previous verse where I said he does not say we are never to be angry. Here it doesn't mean we are never to use our tongues. He is not saying we are never to preach, never to teach, or share the gospel. This does not mean that we never proclaim Christ or you who are hearing the gospel. You're not liable to hear what I'm saying because the preacher is not bridling his tongue. First, that this is not the understanding of this passage. You've heard the saying, preach the gospel always and sometimes use words. But that is not Christian. That is mysticism. It's a form of asceticism with roots in Eastern false religion. This had led many in the centuries before to a vow of silence amongst the monks. So he is not saying we are never to use our tongue. But we are to use the wisdom which God gave us when we do use our tongue. We are to guide it or control it, being self-controlled in our speech. Because our speech was given to us. Words were given to us to use. It is a gift. This is what separates us from all of creation. This is what separates humans made in the image of God. We were created to speak. God spoke all things into existence. But our speech is to be used for good and not for evil. And Jesus spoke. Jesus spoke and he proclaimed the gospel loudly, clearly. He proclaimed it in the streets freely. And Jesus used his words for good, you see. When he said to sinners, I forgive you. And he said to the self-righteous and 
those who would reject him. He warned them of hell. So here, James is addressing the content of our speech. He is not speaking to the amount either, or how much you use your tongue. We, we can say very little and yet be not self controlled in our speech as far as content. We, we, knows, we know of the short two word phrases known as curse words. And they display lack of self-control. And then there are those who have lots to say. And oftentimes we should take heed to what they are saying. So bridling the tongue has more to do with content rather than with length. And we are to control that content using godly wisdom and fear. Why is James saying all this? Well, throughout the letter, he is addressing many sins. But one that stands out the most is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy being the main issue. As much time is spent on it from chapters 2 to 4. And out of hypocrisy and hatred comes slander. Slandering someone, de defacing the image of God. Remember, Jesus warned of this when we would say, you fool. And this is why. And this is why Jesus would later warn us not to make our religion or righteousness a public matter because it could lead to hypocrisy. And this is the one sin that for many people, for many of us, may go unnoticed. And it, ex it is expressed in the way we use our tongue. We often believe we are at a high point in our Christian lives. We believe we have conquered every other sin, but then this one tends to remain. And we become hardened in it because there is much self-justification that goes with it thinking oh well that's just a little sin that's no big deal this is this is a sin that is not under our radar and and it goes without detection or check and it leaves entire lives destroyed in its tracks our tongues are naturally filled with slander deceit and lies and it will lead to destruction. It is the hypocrite's sin and it blinds them. Having the appearance of godliness but with our tongues passing judgments and slander. How easy is it for all of us to fall into this? Maybe because our tongues are so close to our brains that words are so easily to slip out and cause destruction. We are to consider what James is saying in this text, especially now when slander has become the acceptable sin in the church. If we disagree with someone, uh, usually over some non-essential issue, some small issue, it's usually these issues that we cause the most bitter fights over. We believe we have license, and I'm not sure from where, to sin against our brother or sister in Christ, to discredit them and their arguments. And then it eventually becomes personal attacks, which ends up with more bitterness, hatred, and anger. In fact, it is from anger of the heart which comes slander an insult of the tongue. And all of these sins, Jesus taught, make us liable to hell. It comes from a heart of hypocrisy, which in essence is blindness and ignorance of one, one's own self. 
So in matters of dispute in the church, James says, if you want to test whether or not you are truly religious, truly God-fearing, bridle or, or guide your tongue in speech. In other words, display gentleness and self-control. Because judgment, even in regard to sin, if we we are calling out a sin in the church, that that judgment that we are partaking of or, or that we are thinking through is meant to restore, not to take down or destroy. It is meant to restore our brother. And if we are not displaying gentleness and self-control in our speech toward one another. Our religion is useless. It is not pure or true because the opposite is produced by passion, anger. And as it says in verse 20, it does not produce the righteousness of God, no matter how true what we are saying is. And this should be a wake-up call for all of us. Then Paul, um, then James, sorry, goes on to describe what pure religion is in verse 27. In verse 27, James goes on to describe that religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. He breaks up pure and undefiled religion in two parts here. Broadly speaking, it is the love we have for one another and the hatred of the world, or worldliness to be more exact. Now before I move forward, I would like to clarify What he is not saying, he is not saying that this is all there is in regard to religion. He is not saying that pure or true religion is found only in our actions and practice. In other words, we can't can't say forget about all that Jesus talk and let's just do, let's just visit orphans and widows. He is not saying that doctrine is not important. Rather, he assumes that they have the true faith in these churches, that they have true doctrine in his letter, that they know the truth of Christ. And it is doctrine that he is teaching. He is not saying that knowledge is not important and defending the truth is not important or not to be done. That would be inconsistent with the first verses of chapter 1 and 2 of this letter. Because he begins with sound doctrine. He says the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ that, that has doctrine embedded into it. It is the foundation of all of our practice. And it would be inconsistent with the rest of scripture where it places emphasis on doctrine. If our foundation is not Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you do or what charity you're a part of. If you reject Jesus Christ, your good works toward your neighbor will not stand on the day of judgment. It will be rejected. So what he is saying is that religion that is only all talk, all ritual, all doctrine with no outward manifestations of mercy and love toward others is false religion. True and pure religion is sound in doctrine, sound in religious observance or worship, and it is sound in practice and life. It is whole. It is complete religion, which makes a whole or complete person in Christ. You can't have one area sound 
and not the other, in other words. So first, let us look. It is to love others. He is here speaking directly about the second table of the law, the last six of the Ten Commandments, as there is an active application to the law. We, we see this in uh, our confession of faith that we uh, confess this morning and, and on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus doesn't only give the negative side of the law, but he also gives positive action in our confession of faith does as well. So it's not just to fulfill the law. It's not just I don't lie, I don't steal, I don't bother my neighbors. It's not just saying I don't kill. But it's also asking the question, what are you doing to preserve life? What are you doing to uphold the reputation of another person's name when it is being slandered. The, the best way we can look at this is see what Jesus did in his active obedience or his active life in regard to his neighbors. So the question is, is what are you doing actively in regard to your neighbors, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ? He says, Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father, meaning what is truly pleasing to God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Now, we, we find a hard application for us here today because we can't actually visit anyone, right? Uh, most of us are isolated in our homes. So if there was another translation, we would probably say maybe make a phone call. But it's not just stopping by to say hello here or, or calling just to say hello. It, it could be that, outwardly speaking, but it is with a heart of care and love for the other person's well-being. You are, you are calling to see if they are okay, whether physical or, or, or spiritual affliction. Specifically here, this affliction is stemming from Losing the head of one's household or the provider of the household, which brings in itself a whole host of problems, both physically and spiritually. The orphan lost a father and the widow lost her husband. You can only imagine the pain and the struggle accompanying this sort of loss. And we think of today and all of that we're losing in the midst of a pandemic and those who are sick and those who are hurting, those who have died and the effects that it has on whole families. We think of the trials physically, spiritually. We think of the afflictions physically, spiritually. And we think of even the temptations to sin. Now more than ever, temptation to sin is higher in isolation, the temptation to greed, the temptation to cut others off, even the temptation to use our tongues in the wrong manner. And since it happened in the midst of tax season, maybe the temptation to cheat on our taxes so we can have a little more because we don't know what the future is going to hold. But if we notice in this definition of what pure religion is, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? Isn't this how God is described all throughout the Old Testament? He is described in this way in our call to worship this morning. The father of the fatherless and the protector of widows. It is the nature and character of God. And isn't this what Christ puts on display as our faithful Savior in this world, going about doing good, who has adopted the fatherless into the family of God, 
making us children of God. He, he says in John 14, 18, I will not leave you as orphans. If you are outside of Christ, you do not have God as your father. So in other words, you, you, you are technically an orphan, right? But it says, if children, then we are heirs of all the promises of God, heirs of Christ. We were the ungodly who were without a father, a bride without a bridegroom, a wife without a husband. Christ turned the tables and showed us God. He showed us his gracious, compassionate, and loving character. And if we look back to verse 18, aren't we called to be a kind of first fruits of his creation? In other words, we are to display God's character if we are true children of God in mercy and sympathy toward others in affliction. And throughout the Old Testament, God calls his children to do justice to the fatherless and the widows meaning to help them in their affliction. Oftentimes we, we think of justice or social justice in modern political categories, or, or we automatically associate what it means to do justice with a political movement. If you choose to do so, that's fine, but, but it, that's not the only way that we do justice or live just lives. Justice in scripture means doing anything possible in your, considering your circumstances, considering where you are, anything that helps to alleviate the burden of the affliction. It could be as simple as visiting or calling with a word of comfort or even giving to the diaconal offering. Or dropping off some goods to someone's front doorstep who is in need. And we must recognize this is not the only way to please God in mercy. For our church, our own church may not be filled with orphans and widows. But there is still affliction and pain and hardships that we can tend to. Jesus addresses the blessed ones and Matthew 25, 35 to 36, when he says, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And he's giving a variety of things that the faithful were engaged in. They, maybe they didn't do all of this on a list and they didn't hold a list, but it describes the one who is a child of God, naturally flowing out of Gratitude to a God who has shown us much mercy. I'm thankful for the office, officers that we have as deacons here. But we are all called to be deacons, meaning to be servants of one another. Secondly, he continues to describe this pure and undefiled religion as to keep oneself or guard oneself. So, so there is another active role here. There's another active role that we are to be confronting and actively engaged in a battle to keep oneself unstained from the world. In other words, we are to be clean from the ways of the world around us, to be heavenly minded and not worldly-minded, to grow spiritually. This will, uh, we will address later tonight in the evening service. But here he is calling them to heavenly-mindedness rather than being stained by the world. Now the problem with that is, is that worldliness comes with the territory. It, it is so ingrained into who we are as humans and sinners we are all born worldly, overwhelmed, and constantly distracted by the world. But we must clarify what type of worldliness he is speaking of here. 
because I believe the, the mistake would be is going off into extremes. There, there's always two ditches on the, sides, the side of the road, right? When we go off into extremes and we become irresponsible in our certain areas or certain spheres of work and influence, whether in the home or in our vocation. So what does it mean to be unstained from the world? I find this to be helpful for your encouragement because I want to describe what it doesn't mean first. First, it doesn't mean abstinence from certain foods or abstaining from marriage or leaving our worldly responsibilities to our wives and our children. God gave us all things freely to enjoy with self-control in regards to food and marriage we're to enjoy all these things with self-control, and as long as it doesn't lead to sin, he has given us these things freely. And Paul rebukes these ideas of asceticism as the teaching of demons in 1 Timothy 4. And, and he defines this way of thinking as self-made religion, which promotes Severity of the body, beating one's body as religious devotion. We, we, we see this centuries ago with the desert monks as they try to escape society and, and cut themselves off from the world in order to grow spiritually. And that, that's the point here. It, it's doing these things in order to grow spiritually, to be more heavenly minded. I, I see nothing wrong with abstaining from food because you're dieting. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But in order to grow spiritually, Paul says that these men who came up with these ideas, that they can do that, that they are puffed up without reason. These are the men who are puffed up with knowledge and a sensuous mind. That, that doing these things and abstaining from marriage and the, these sorts of things, it's actually the opposite of what they are trying to accomplish. It is actually worldliness. It's worldly thinking. Uh, we see this in false religion all around us, how you know, they restrict you to certain food and, and, and marriage is, 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 is staining yourself with the world. That's worldliness. But Paul says, these have an appearance of wisdom and godliness, but never produce any spiritual value whatsoever he says they are puffed up with religious pride and they are not producing any spiritual growth because that is not what it means to be unstained from the world marriage or being married is not worldliness and remaining single if you are gifted to remain single it doesn't mean you have accelerated spiritually. You were given that gift for service, to serve the body of Christ. It's more opportunity to serve. You're not surpassing those who are married, and those who are married are not surpassing the single person either. We find this danger in escapism trying to escape the world, escape society. We find this inclination in us as Christians. And we don't find it in going into the world and trying to transform society and then end up looking more like society or more like the world. It's in neither of these two ditches on the sides of the road. So if it's not this or that, it's not found in escaping the world. It's not found in going into the world and trying to transform it to make the world look like the church. What does it mean to keep oneself unstained from the world? Well, James goes on to define it in chapter 4 as he rebukes them and describes what it means to be a friend of the world, 
Uh, we often summarize it as the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, uh, the pride of life, or in other words, sin. So what he regards as signs of worldliness are tied to earlier verses in this chapter, uh, verses 19 to 20, and it's also tied to what we have covered so far in, in verse 26. He, he tells them to control, control the tongue, to put away anger with which fuels the tongue. Their worldliness is described to be in the way that they quarrel and fight out of their passions, out of their desires for the things of the world, worldly riches and gain. They, they have become cutthroats, kind of like uh, the business world. You, you know, there, there are certain aspects that we must take on from the business world and financially as a church. But, but the problem here is that they have become cutthroats in the church. They fight over when they are not successful in being cutthroats and when they are not successful in gaining the things of the world. And when they don't receive it, they fight over it, which eventually leads to murder, either murder in the heart or actual physical murder. They are proud of their own achievements, whether in the world or in matters of the faith. You can be proud of being this kind of church, right? They speak evil against one another, putting oneself over another in judgment, being a judge over souls, making judgments on one's heart that only God can make since he is the only one judge and lawgiver. So this would naturally make them Busybodies, gossiping, using their tongue for slander, rather than being doers of the law. Because if you think about it, if, if you go around making judgments, passing judgments on every person you see, then are we truly keeping our hands to the plow and doing the law as we expect others to do? It goes back to what Jesus taught and removing the log out of our own eye. Now, this doesn't mean we excuse unrepentant sin or never confront it, but where is your heart in the matter is the question. And if we leave all these things out, right, if we are to cut all of this out of the nature of man, what are we left with? Well, we become a people of mercy. Again, going back to visiting the orphans and widows, he is stripping them down to what they are called to be. Today, we have an entire culture built on the foundation of rebellion and using our tongue in the way we like. This is why he begins with bridling the tongue. We live in an age of speaking out of turn for the sake of self-promotion and fulfilling our own carnal desires. And it is a skewed view of freedom of speech. But here he says, keep yourselves unstained from the world, which the fruit of it is found in our speech and how well we control our tongues. And we are to grow weary of this fading world that is so prideful in its boasts, the pride of life. This world that offers comforts that can never truly comfort the soul, but are mere distractions from eternity. Oftentimes, in considering this passage, oftentimes as a church universal, as evangelicals, we often place much, much emphasis on heart change or conversion that we become conversionists where there is no action. There, there is no moving from conversion of the heart to practice. Just like we can disconnect doctrine from life, we disconnect inner heart change from the outward actions and behavior of believers. 
But in Ezekiel 36, 27, with the promise of the Spirit comes action. And it says this, I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And God says he is the first cause of this. We can't look over that. He is the one who moves us or causes us to walk in his ways, to will and to work for his good pleasure. And here James defines what that good pleasure is. I pray that your doctrine is sound. I pray that you're seeking to know more and more about the Lord and his word in dialogue with the saints who have gone before us. But is there a true desire? To walk in true religion, holiness toward God, and righteousness toward our neighbor. We must consider the coming of Christ. The coming of Christ in the womb of the Virgin Mary is often called the visitation. Why? Because God came to visit lowly and sinful man. And he came, took on flesh as a man. And the emphasis in his ministry, no doubt, was preaching. He went around preaching the word with both warnings and comfort. But he also visited those in affliction and he healed them. And I understand he didn't heal everyone in the world. But he was healing the sick to reveal something to man, to to Israel, to those whom he would call out of darkness. He was revealing who he was as Lord over creation, having the power to heal and to restore. But also, he was revealing God's gracious, loving, compassionate nature and character. The one who's able to not only heal the body, but heal and comfort the soul. Pointing to the ultimate healing and comfort that comes in eternity. He showed the love of the Father towards those who are left stranded to fend for themselves. The Father's love toward the innocent of Israel. So we can say, as I said earlier, the true balance of true religion, speaking and acting, the true balance is found in this active obedience or the active life of Jesus Christ. And it is his spirit that dwells in those who have received Christ as their savior. And it is in this spirit that we are called to walk in. He teaches uh, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. It is what comes out. He teaches, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And vain religion is proclaimed. Religion that has no legs to stand on. Religion that is sound in one area but is hypocritical in the other, which makes it total hypocrisy. It is out of the mouth, the uncontrolled tongue, that displays our fallen human nature, our evil and sinful nature. And the only correction for this nature is in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he pardons us, when he saves us, And when he gives us his Holy Spirit. And how can we who have sensed the love and mercy of God. Not be loving and merciful toward those in affliction. Toward those in trials. And toward those in temptation. Especially with our speech. And how can we go about chanting, crucify him again and again for the sake of the world 
and to justify our sloppy tongues so that we may ignore his hard sayings in scripture. But verse 25, if we go back, he calls us to persevere in his word, to persevere in his law as he liberates us. We can't forget the liberation that we have when we come to Christ. And that liberation is so that we may show mercy. Not quarrelsome as the world. Not domineering as the world is. But examples of true faith. And the grounds for this is found in the word as it reveals the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, which James will begin in the next chapter. And this faith is one of mercy towards sinners who saw their need of him. So we begin with that. Do you see your need of Christ at this moment? That you have not fulfilled this law. That you have not been merciful. This mercy was revealed in the word as it happened thousands of years ago when our Savior died on the cross and rose again in three days. Oh, the grace of God in Christ to pardon the weak, the frail, the helpless, those who can't better on their own, who can't get better on their their own. And in response to this mercy, Can't we do the same? Can't we crucify ourselves and our lusts and tend to the needy? Tend to those who need the grace of Christ the most. Not just the two categories of orphan and widows, though those those are examples, but to all who need the grace of Christ in both physical and spiritual matters. Can't we crucify ourselves and remain unstained from the world? Because first, we are unstained because we were washed clean by the blood of Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word that you have revealed to us this morning. Thank you that you use weak and frail sinners as ourselves to both proclaim the word and to seek to live the word out in the world to those who need it most and those who call upon your name, those who have come with humble, weak, and frail hearts, those who have recognized their neediness as orphans without a father, without a God, We have come to share the love of Christ, though we are still constantly in need of your grace. Father, we ask that you would go forth with us in the midst of a trying hour, in the midst of temptation, affliction due to the pandemic around us, as we are isolated from one another. We pray that you would use this time for pruning, for showing our sins clearly for what they are, and for helping us to grow by the grace of your Spirit in us, to grow in holiness and righteousness toward you and toward one another. Seal all these things to our hearts. In Christ's name, amen.